This is the CMO and Joe podcast. We interview today's most inspiring chief marketing officers and savvy marketers of lucrative direct to consumer. Hey, Carrie, welcome to the podcast. Thanks, Joe. Great to be here. Really excited to have you on the podcast. Obviously, that you're the founder of Chimani, founder and CEO, and um, you guys have grown to such large, uh, large uh, lengths now. You're the, you're the number one uh, mobile park app at the App Store, which is awesome. Um, but before I get to jump into all that, uh, perhaps give us a little backstory and uh, who Carrie is, what you're up to. Yeah, yeah, sure. So, so I was a kid who grew up in uh, New England and here in the states, and. Uh, you know, as soon as I got to college, I got the travel bug, and I ended up actually going to school out in California, um, small international school that I wasn't there more than a year, and I shipped off to the Nepal and lived in Nepal, and uh, and then came back and uh, ended up then going to live in Zimbabwe, and really kind of went deep into international development. Um, but along the way, I realized I I had this knack for computers and real interest in computers and got real fortunate. I was, I was interning at the, the first internet service provider in Zimbabwe. And uh, I actually got hired right out of college to work on a project out of Boston um, and returned to the States. And I started working on the first email network for healthcare workers in Sub-Saharan Africa and Southeast Asia. And it was a wild ride. So, you know, a lot of international travel in my background, but now living in Maine and still sort of looking at how can you take technology and apply it in unique ways that have an impact on people so that's kind of the short backstory <laughs> <laughs> that's awesome um, so what what kind of made you want to pursue a career in um, entrepreneurship yeah I mean it was really my father I mean he had I'd seen him he you know, he was he delivered bread for years countless years and and he took the leap of faith and started his own business um, and that was sort of really, you know, I think, you know, he was definitely the inspiration for trying something, you know, and trying something different. Um, he had created, you know, he built a, uh, um, basically it was a, it was a health club um, that he started to kind of get into uh, back when there was kind of a bit of a health craze going on in the 80s. Uh, and so it was really just realizing that you just didn't have to do sort of like the grind and sort of walk into a job. Um, you know, and then just sort of from there, just sort of a sense of wanting to build things, you know, and really sort of understanding a problem and recognizing that you just, it doesn't exist. So why not build it? You know, and I love that notion of kind of creating things and especially obviously creating things that have value and have real meaning for people that want to use them. So that was definitely, you know, the, the driving factor of a lot of what I do. Well, that's really awesome. Yeah, that's kind of like the main pillar of entrepreneurship, just finding a problem and wanting to solve it and build it yourself. Um, I guess to give a little context for the listeners, um, what would you say Chimani does in a couple sentences? Yeah, sure. So what we do is we provide uh, recreational guides for people uh, visiting iconic destinations like national parks. And so we're going to basically be what you previously might buy as a paper guidebook uh, back when we had bookstores or a lot of bookstores and you know getting all of that 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 information that you would need to visit a destination and our focus is really on outdoor destinations um, like national parks or state parks um, or states as well in general kind of when folks want to visit a, a destination but want to go to beaches and want to get, get outside and go to nature preservers so you know we're about really helping the user figure out exactly you know not only just sort of where it is but you know what do you what can you expect and really what's the backstory because i think you know whether it's a small nature preserve or a large national park you know there's there's a story there that every one of them has and why it was created um so we really like to take that historical angle as well um, we like to say that you know google maps and Apple Maps, they do a great job getting you someplace, but they can't tell you anything about the place that you arrived. And that's really kind of the niche that we fill. <laughs> <laughs> no, that's awesome. Uh, yeah, when I was doing some uh, research before our uh, podcast, I, I saw that you were a first time founder. Um, and obviously, um, we have lots of listeners that are aspiring entrepreneurs or even entrepreneurs themselves. But uh, what were some of the 
challenges that you faced, um, or maybe the biggest challenge that you faced uh, during your entrepreneurial journey, and what can you, what did you learn from that uh, experience? Yeah, I mean, you, you maybe unfortunately, I, I always sort of uh, approach people um, always trusting them. <laughs> uh, I my my first half, you know, or I I I think I have a healthy amount of. Um, a cautiousness, as I say, when you get into, especially business relationships, um, you know, there, there's just been, you know, it's one of the things I always sort of approach people, rec- you know, thinking, all right, I, I can trust you and assuming that I can trust you. And that doesn't always work out, you know, especially when you have money involved and you have business and you've got people, you know, different visions. And, and so, um, you know, that was just, that was just a learning experience. And I think it's just, everyone just kind of has to be cautious. Um, I, because of the, what I was doing, and like I said, I, I want to build things that have a positive impact on people's lives. Um, there's an altruistic approach to what I'm doing, and I think sometimes, you know, um, I, I I tend to think that everyone else has that same sort of desire to create great things. But in the end of the day, you know, when you're building companies, for-profit companies, you know, it's about business for a lot of people and, and kind of the bottom line. So, and that's been a, a lesson for me to sort of rein in the altruistic side somewhat and. And just kind of look at every situation with sort of two lenses, sort of the, the I want to trust you, but all right, you got you to gotta show me that I can trust you. <laughs> <laughs> nah, I feel like I'm very similar to, to you as well, Kerry. I'm, I'm very optimistic wanting to trust people, but obviously you get into some situations where yeah. it kind of burns you at the end. But um, one question I did want to ask was, um, what were some of the best resources that's helped you along the way uh, to get to where you are today? Yeah, I mean, once you get into, and I'm sure you know, like once you get into that whole entrepreneur ecosystem, other founders are like gold, you know. So it's like that that personal network that you start to grow, but but really sort of specific, like founders who are like, you know, it's the people that I can sit down and we can really seriously talk about the same issues that we've been having, you know, whether they've scaled and it's a large company. In the end of the day, you all kind of start at the same point. And I have found the greatest therapy and support from other founders. You know, um, there are plenty of people who are out there give you advice and whatnot, uh, but but they never started a company. And I've always found that, you know, it's more just opinions as opposed to sort of uh, therapy, which is a lot of like, you know, back when we were doing sort of coffee meetings on a regular basis, you know, it was, it was, I always found that it was therapy uh, and trying to do it on a regular basis, meeting up with the different founders that are in my personal network. Absolutely. It's funny that you speak of uh, meeting up and obviously um, meeting up's a little bit tougher these days with the whole pandemic, uh, COVID-19 going on, but what have been sort of the biggest challenges for you personally, or even professionally uh, that the pandemic has, uh, um, I guess the last four or five months for you? Yeah, I mean, it's, 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 it, there's certain, there's an underlying anxiety that I think all, all of us kind of feel because there's a sense of unknown. Um, and, and our, whether it's in our personal life or even our, our professional life, everything sort of becomes disrupted. So that anxiety, I think we, you know, it's important for us all to acknowledge that it's there. Um, but a lot of times that eats away at you and it's sort of whatever stress that you normally would have, you've got this added level of stress. Um, and then that doesn't even account for when you now start to kind of go, go to the grocery store and, you know, and interactions with other people are completely different now. And so um, there's an added stress of kind of going out into the world. So um, recognizing that and really trying to manage this sort of added stress. Um, and then just the re- reality, I mean, we were already distributed before COVID, so it didn't act, uh, impact that. But, but then my wife started working at home and then my kids are working at home, <laughs> going to school at home, you know, so that it's like, oh my goodness, you know, you get a real sense of like, oh, you know, there's, this is a very small house um, all of a sudden, uh, <laughs> whereas everyone used to just go away for the day. Um, and so just recognizing like the other thing that I've taken away from it is just like how valuable it is just to go for a walk and just, you know, get outside. And, um, you know, we, we haven't, we've done the most amount of sort of family short walks, hikes than we've ever done in I think these last six months. And, you know, I hope that other people have done that too, but that's something that we want to really kind of keep and continue um, because it really does clear the mind when you have all this added anxiety going on. 
Absolutely. It's funny. Um, don't put you on the spot, but I'm, I'm curious, what's your favorite, uh, favorite hike or uh, trail? <laughs> yeah. So every, you know, I'm always asking questions like, Oh, you know, what national park uh, um, do you, uh, do you like the most? And it's, it's so hard. Cause like, obviously like national parks are like the most incredible. Um, I will say one hike that I just did actually this past weekend um, definitely rose to the top. So on the northeast corner of the coast of Maine, there's a public uh, land area called Cutler Coast. And you look directly across to Grand Manan Island, which is uh, actually a part of Nova Scotia. And so you're, you're basically in the Bay of Fundy. Um, and it, it's just an isolated coastline of just 100, 100 foot cliffs with pine forests that you get to hike a mile into and then it's eight miles along this coastline. And you're just looking across to Grand Manon and, and then out to the Atlantic. And it's so incredibly isolated. Um, I have to say, so Cutler Coast in the northeast corner of Maine, looking across to Nova Scotia is definitely on one of the top, top of my list right now. <laughs> <laughs> no, that's awesome. Um, but yeah, I just want to quickly switch gears. Um, I'll get more, maybe your perspective on business. Um, one thing that I'm always curious about uh, with founders like yourself is how do you build the, the right team? Like how is that, uh, what's, I guess, what's your process on building uh, and scaling a team? Uh, trial and error. <laughs> <laughs> uh, you know, I mean, I guess one of the things I would throw in there as well in terms of advice is like, you know, that old, old expression, you know, um, hire so fire fast. Um, you know, I think one of the things I've learned is you, you got to get rid of people a lot faster. And especially if there's any sense of, if there's any sense of negative energy that can come into a team, it just, it just permeates across. And, you know, you may have an incredibly high performing engineer, but if there's any degree of negative energy, then that energy trumps, you know, whatever skill set they have and it, it needs to be removed. So, um, you know, just really trying to realize that, Teams are built over time and there are certain combinations that are best and high performing and you need to swap out the components a lot. And, and when you know you've got it, you've got it, you know, it feels it. Everyone's running, everyone's hitting the same goals and things are moving seamlessly. I think when teams are, you know, every team requires some amount of work and you're always going to run into challenges, but when it feels like the running, the team functioning high performance wise is more work, um, or is, is really kind of you're spending more time trying to keep things moving forward, um, then there's something that needs to be adjusted. Um, so, so, yeah, trial and error. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, trial and error. Seems like that's a common theme for entrepreneurs. You just got to yeah. try and fail and pivot and yeah. adapt. Yeah, uh, yeah no, that's, that's awesome. Um, from when you first started, um, obviously you've grown so much and you're, you're a successful brand now, but how has the industry changed from when you first started uh, to now? Yeah, I mean, we were because we went mobile first. You know, it really felt like it was the wild west of apps. You know, because um, I mean, back in, geez, the first you know, the first app was launched in two thousand ten, and you think back, it's like ten years ago in the app world. It was crazy, um, you know. And and so back then, you know, everyone thought you're going to make your money off of advertising, um, and that that was going to really be a, a viable model. But, you know, it, and then also, too, it was sort of that notion that got lost with the web conversion. A lot of people thought that people would actually pay for content. So the, the paper download model was also assumed to be another viable business model. And that was clearly not the case. You know, people would pay for widgets or like the fart app, like the original app back in the day for 99 cents. And, you know, and, and so now, you know, advertising you know, unless you're a Facebook or an Instagram, you know, where you've got billions of eyeballs, not millions of, of eyeballs, you know, advertising is not going to work for, you know, independent app developers or smaller app developers. And so you, fortunately, I feel like the subscription model is finally turning into an established business model for mobile app providers. And I think that there's a, there, it works for a significant majority 
of people. I mean, the gaming category is kind of a, like a slightly different category, but even if you look at subscriptions or like virtual items and, and, and in the gaming world, that itself is sort of established itself too. You know, games have kind of established how they sort of make money above and beyond just kind of all these banner ads. Um, so I feel like the subscription model has really come to be a mature business and revenue model for the mobile industry. And so I really feel like now when we talk to potential investors, you know, it's, it, you don't have to, they don't look at you like, how are you going to make money? You know, it's like, Oh, we're a subscription. This is how much it costs annual. It's, it's a lifetime subscription. You know, this is how it works. And, and there's no trying to sort of wonder how you're going to become a large business um, because you see large companies I and mean, Tinder is a great example. They're just, you know, they're kind of killing it with pr uh, premium subscriptions. Um, so that is definitely been the biggest maturity in terms of the, the mobile app space is that it has normalized from a business model perspective absolutely uh, one thing you mentioned that caught my attention is um, investors and obviously uh, when you're building and scaling a company uh, that might be part of the equation at some point uh, but from your experience Carrie what's or how do you market your product or even idea to investors um, to help get that kind of um, capital into your business yeah I mean I, I think it's it's a lot of um, so first trying to identify who's the right fit you know, it's sort of like, it, it is a lot like kind of dating. I like, um, met my wife online, you know, match.com. There's a little plug for them, you know, and, and you sort of filter through. You're like, all right, what are your interests? What are your, you know, and, and that's really, uh, I think so much front loaded research needs to go into really trying to find those matches so that when you do reach out and you figure out that connection on how to get to them, it makes sense, you know, you're not wasting their time um, and making sure that there's a fit because so many of them, it's pretty clear what they're interested in for the most part. Um, and that is just really is, you know, the golden processes. And this is why I value my professional network and working with other founders is how do you get an introduction, that warm introduction you know, to an, an investor so that you can at least sort of ride on the coattails of someone who knows you and you know they're more apt to really kind of take the time of day and understand what you're working on and what problem you're trying to address um and then it's in, in the end of the day it's also a numbers game <laughs> it's just it's like i you know i hate to say it but it's kind of like dialing for dollars but it's all you know through emails and introductions and you know and and, and pitches <laughs> <laughs> no, absolutely uh, speaking on that though what's um what's a, what's a brand that you're um that you really admire yeah well i'm, I'm a little biased there are two brands uh so i think um so subaru so full transparency we, we work with them um but i think they've done an excellent job at, at when you when you see a subaru when you you buy a subaru you are they inspire you to really want to go and, and explore the world and be adventurous um that's really the type of car that they're they're building and the original Subaru, the, the rumor is, is that it was a, a vehicle that was used in a national park in Japan and someone from America was visiting and they saw that car and they said, we got to bring that to the U.S. Um, you know, so that original Subaru, its roots are sort of inherent in sort of, you know, the marketing that they built around it. So I think they've done a remarkable job. Um, but I will also just say like Tesla is just amazing you know, because it's so much more than a car company. And it's been able to really, in many ways, replace that cult-like following which Apple had during the 90s and, and, and through the early 2000s. Um, so that, you know, there's, and obviously you've got, a, you've got a personality attached to it, which kind of drives the nar narrative and all these different crazy places. And, um, but it truly is like, you know, people think it's a car company, but it's becoming so much more than a car company. And I think that's really Really what's driving a lot of this cult like following around it so definitely i think tesla is like right up on the top there these days absolutely it almost feels like tesla's a religion now it's just so <laughs> it just has that cult like following um yeah the church of elon <laughs> yeah exactly <laughs> but uh what's uh how would you say or what, what sort of elements would you say um a great customer experience um has like whether it be a product or a service but what sort of elements would you say are a part of a great customer experience yeah i think it all you know the it's pretty clear and it's sort of one of those things where you you know when you see it where the experience is truly about the customer 
and it's been informed by the customer. Um, in terms of a product kind of like, how do you build a great product that is really customer focused or centric? You know, I, I really feel like you build something and then you just start removing. You know, the, the you know, engineers in particular and product you know, uh, designers inevitably build something that's too complex. And you just, you got to spend your time with the iteration cycle of just removing and removing and boiling it down to what are those core, one or two core features which really drive the experience and what people really want. And, and then just really build out that to allow users to get to that functionality as easily as possible. Um, so it's sort of like one of those things like, I don't know, what's that famous case? It's like, you know, porn is sort of pornographic. It's like, you know, when you see it, it's sort of like a good user experience is like, you know, when you see it. <laughs> you <know? laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> but you, you know, it's just, you can't really articulate it. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> well, that's funny. <laughs> you know, when you see it. Absolutely. That's true. Uh, uh, what's, uh, what's one question that you never get asked, Carrie, that uh, you wish you would be asked? Yeah. Um, what sort of sacrifices has my spouse made <laughs> in order for me to do all of this? Um, you know, they are, um, so my wife is the unsung hero and, and I think there's, there's always going to be a founder story where their, their partner, their spouse is going to be like, you know, that rock for these, uh, these people. And it's never quite brought to the forefront of really how much these these people sacrifice and how appreciative they are you know you need to be of them and and also you know balancing you know it's like you got to manage a business but you also have to manage your relationships your family you know so that you're not sacrificing them because it's so easy to just be so fully engaged in what you're doing if you don't have a balanced approach then you're just going to burn you know your foundation um so you know, it's always nice to get a question on some, you know, around what sort of impact has this had on your spouse? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, our, our better half is always, I guess, keeps us centered. <laughs> exactly, exactly. <laughs> um, but yeah, one, one other question. I only have a few more questions here for you, Carrie, but one question I'm curious, um, hypothetically, uh, I'm, always, I'm always curious is, say you got 50% extra more budget, um, how would you go about um, I guess growing the company, or what sort of what, what would be some of the things that you would uh, implement with that extra extra budget? Yeah, so so immediately, it's I divide it between product improvement and then um, marketing and spend. We're at a stage where we've got a good sense of um, you, you can spend X amount of dollars and figure out pretty much how much you're going to get and. And being a mobile app, a lot of that is actually through paid acquisition. Unfortunately, it's it's pretty much Facebook slash Instagram or or, or Google, or in a degree sort of Apple search terms. Um, so there really are really just three different areas which you'd be spending that money. Um, so half of it would go there, but you always have to be improving your product. And and I have a never ending list of product features and improvements. Um, you know, we're in a point where we really need to refresh the design of our app. Um, it's, it's been around for a while and we know that um, there needs to be some new elements that are make the whole experience easy. So um, there's just sort of a short list of design changes that would immediately get that, <laughs> that money and move things forward. So, so the short answer is 50% on product improvements and then uh, you know, half of that 50% on product, the other half on ramping up marketing. Absolutely. Uh, one thing that uh, I forgot to touch on was uh, earlier you mentioned how uh, with the pandemic, um, the house gets smaller, essentially. Um, everybody's at home. It's harder to differentiate work from uh, home life. Um, but for you personally, how has your work life balance kind of been the last few few months? Yeah, it's been it's been definitely challenging. Um, I think one of the things that, uh, so one of the products that we've launched is a recreational guide for the state of Maine. Um, so taking the guides that we're making for specific national parks, but looking at the entire state 
Um, I will be completely honest. Part of the reason why I did it is because I wanted to get out of the house. <laughs> so so I, this isn't necessarily a scalable model. It's a proof of concept because I won't be able to sort of, you know, we won't be able to build these guides like we have this one. Um, but I've been going to a lot of these places and, and, you know, and I love to take photographs. And so taking personal photographs of it and, and and we use OpenStreetMap as our base data. So if, if the park hasn't been mapped, I'm like sort of like a GIS nerd as well. I like to record the tracks. And, and so totally not a scalable model. When we think about doing it for the rest of the states, it'll be a different approach. Um, but that has been my therapy is, is um, having to research all of these places that are going into the guides. So. <laughs> and we've been fortunate because like we, you know, I haven't left the state of Maine and since, I don't know, since, March and so Fort Delay, Maine is a large state, so I've uh, been able to kind of be focused on Maine and there's plenty to do here and and working on that guide was one way to sort of deal with therapy of what's going on with COVID. Absolutely. What's, what are some of the things that um, you're proud of that maybe uh, we haven't touched on uh, in the podcast? Yeah, I mean, I think um, you know, it's actually something I did previously. <laughs> I kind of, I mentioned it. It was sort of crazy. Like this, this uh, nonprofit that I worked for in the early '90s, the one that hired me straight out of college. Um, we built this crazy email network, um, which we we actually uh, we had a satellite built, which was a low Earth orbit satellite, which a LEO satellite. Which now these days you you hear about them all the time because Tesla's um, or um, SpaceX's Starlink network is based on this concept of LEO satellites. Um, back then, the only people that had LEO satellites were the CIA, CIA and the KGB. And we launched one. <laughs> anyway, we had this remarkable um, cardiologist who began this project. And, um, and But the whole goal was to increase communication between these physicians and uh, medical students who were based in Sub-Saharan Africa and Southeast Asia because they had no infrastructure. You know, once again, this is pre.com. The only email networks that were in place were, were airline networks um, that would use them for reservations. And that was the only way that you could have data. And so we built this network. We launched the satellite and we used ham radios. And, and I'm dating myself. We used FidoNet <laughs> bulletin board technology to glue it all together. And I was running around all these company, all these countries. I, I do three week travels, I'd fly into Nairobi, I'd be in Kenya for a week, I'd be in Uganda for a week, and then Tanzania, and then I'd fly out and I'd turn around and do it the next month. And, and we're doing all these crazy trainings. And it was like the wild west of the of, of like cyberspace, you know, to kind of date the term again. Um, and it was just crazy times. And so um, I have like a lot of personal sort of like pride for what we did because it was such, we're on such a pioneering kind of project. And then the dot com era came around and the technology was irrelevant, but um, it was just crazy back then. <laughs> so, <laughs> so I'm always still to this day. And I love telling the stories that I have attached with that. Uh, and it was just a really, I was very fortunate to to meet the people that I did and be in the right place and for them to hire me and work with them for five years. So. Well, that's fascinating. Yeah. What's, what, sort of, what sort of unique skill would you say you have? You just have such an amazing journey. It's, uh, it's really interesting. Yeah, I mean, I've been very fortunate to be able to be, I understand and I can um, work with engineers very well. And so I can go very deep uh, concept wise. Um, I've, I learned really early on that there's always gonna be someone who could code faster and better than me, but conceptually I can go very deep and I can then turn around and then compute and communicate a lot of those core concepts to non-technical people. And I think, you know, and translate that into you know, either take a product with a non-technical user experience and really sort of break that down and understand what are the technical components that are really needed to get that done. Um, and being able to really go you know, 50,000 feet all the way down to, you know, uh, five feet, you know, that ability to sort of zoom out and zoom in. Um, that's always been, I think, something that's been one of the skills that has made me you know, successful in everything that I've done. Absolutely. Um, well, since this is a marketing and uh, podcast, what sort of 
uh, social media networks would you say that you're most active on or are your favorites? Yeah. So, so I, it's weird to say, but like LinkedIn is what I probably use the most. I mean, I guess it's more interested in like what the you know, professional contacts are doing. Um, and then um, Twitter, cause just because Twitter is, is um, it's more of a broadcast. And then sometimes I get sucked into um, the, the conversational aspect of it. Uh, but for the most part, I, I have to admit, like, I don't use Facebook at all. I only have to, I have my account just because I have to from an advertising and I have to have an account related to a business account. Um, and then Instagram, it's, I, it amazes me how my daughter and even my wife get so much content from Instagram. Um, but I, do, I really, I don't really use it at all. So, so for me, it's really LinkedIn and, and Twitter. <laughs> <laughs> You're not on TikTok doing TikTok dances? No, I am not. <laughs> <laughs> um, what's uh i guess my last couple of questions what's next for carrie and chimani yeah i mean i think for us it's really um because of covid it's really put the it's acknowledged that getting outside is really important you know we don't know where this is all going um and so one thing that keeps on coming up is uh what 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 do we want to take from this whole experience and keep um, when things begin to sort of quote unquote normalize and I think getting people outside. And so I think that's a really exciting opportunity for us. Um, I think for us, what we're doing is we're, we're going to broaden just from being focused on national parks to, like I said, sort of really statewide um, or, if, you know, in the case of Canada, provincial wide or really kind of um, even throughout the country um, and looking at really every destination has outdoor opportunities you know and that's what i love about these small nature preserves that have been created by a local land trust um and getting people you know access to that and making them aware of that um, not everyone has to go to a yellowstone or you know a Banff or you know or these iconic national parks there are so many opportunities to get outside all around us and so that's really what i'm passionate about and and once again it's this sort of notion that you know everyone is using google maps or apple maps as sort of their travel guide and you know like i said it, people will just show up and they're sort of left wondering what to do um, because you know it'll it'll get you there but it just won't tell you about what to do or different opportunities so i see there's just an enormous problem that's happening um, especially when you look at so we have a partnership with Subaru where we took our Chivani app and we ported it so that it's available directly within the dash of uh, Subaru cars. And so I think that that space more and more you're going to see people interacting with their vehicles. Um, and once again, Tesla has led the way in sort of this whole new experience that you have with your car. Um, and so I think that, you know, we're really excited of making sure that we really are that, that discovery platform that exists not just on your phone, um, but also directly in your car and really driving that experience, no pun intended. <laughs> mm -hmm. That's really awesome. Uh, you mentioned Banff too, so um, I'd, I'm, I'd be pretty stoked once the, <laughs> there's a Chimani <laughs> <laughs> trail to there. I'm always up there. But uh, no, it's been a pleasure to have you on the podcast, Carrie. It's been a pleasure to speak with you and get all your insights on business, entrepreneurship, and even just, uh, yeah, just general insights. But uh, since this is a marketing and branding podcast, I like to end it with the guest saying a word or a phrase to describe their brand. So my last one, <laughs> you, Carrie, is how would you describe Carrie's brand? Yeah, um, one word, perseverance. Uh, you know, it's, you know, whether it, and it goes well because it's like on the business journey, you know, one of the ways that you survive is just through uh, perseverance. But um, even when you're out on the trail, you have to persevere. And, you know, and uh, there are many false summits along the way, um, but if you keep on going, you know, you're, you, you just make progress. And the most important thing is always going forward um, and never sort of being stagnant and staying still. So I, I do truly take a lot of analogy from like, the psychology that you sort of psychological game that you play when you're on these long hikes um, that are challenging physically um, to really sort of building a, a business as well. Um, you know, it, in the entrepreneurial world, as you know, you know, if you are not going forward, things aren't going forward. It's so self 
driven. Um, and that's the same thing with hiking. You know, you always, you, in order to get to the end, you need to keep on going. And you're not going to go anywhere if you just sit down and rest all the time. So <laughs> perseverance is the, is the, the brand for Carrie Gallivan. This episode of the CMO and Joe podcast has ended, but be sure to subscribe for more business strategies and tactics to help you create the profitable and successful business you've always dreamed of. And don't forget to rate and review so we can continue to bring you the best content. See you on the next episode.